Uh, well, uh, thank you everyone and uh, for staying for, uh, for this talk. And today I'm going to talk to you about some of the uh, progress I've made uh, with this uh, very interesting topic, which is uh, solving the phylogeny of the chelicerates as a whole. And, but first, I want to uh, thank uh, the organizers for providing me this opportunity to talk uh, with you today. And, uh, and, and also uh, thank all my collaborators. Many uh, of the things that I'm presenting to you today wouldn't be possible with the help of the, an army of people uh, really that is behind um, um, some of the uh, data and a lot of the fruitful discussions and results. And, and as you can see, I mean, many of you are probably in the audience. So this is a, a great opportunity also to uh, uh, thank you and express my, my gratitude for all, all that um, collaboration. And especially I wanna thank uh, to the extended uh, Sharma lab, uh, including the undergraduate students uh, there as well as the lab of Efrat Gavish Regev, which I feel like my second home. And finally, I'm also gonna acknowledge uh, the funding I've been uh, receiving in support of my research. And without further ado, let's uh, dip into the uh, problem. And this is my diversity slide. And I, uh, with this audience, probably I don't need to spend uh, much time talking about what type of organisms are the subject of, uh, of our study. Um, chelicerates are very diverse, as we all know. Arachnids are the most iconic uh, chelicerates, but we also must remember that uh, the group includes um, marine sea spiders, as well as horseshoe crabs. And if um, it probably the best a starting point for talking about calicet phylogeny is the classic study of Bagel and Polos from 1979. Uh, so this is the first uh, analytical cladistic analysis to include a calicerate and it uses as its out group uh, pycnogonids. So it effectively utilizes and tests the monophyly of arachnida. And uh, and indeed, it is in this study where one of those first uh, patterns is established. And that is the recovery of a monophyletic group that contains all the terrestrial arachnids. And very importantly, it recognizes as uh, the earliest branching arachnid, uh, the scorpions. Uh, it, uh, it is also in this study that several of the very uh, better established groups are first proposed in an analytical basis, including a monophyletic uh, acari, a clade that includes um, hooded, uh, the hooded tick spiders, Rishinule and the acari, uh, named Acaromorpha, as well as a um, sistership relationship between the pseudoscorpions and the solifuge, um, named Aplognemata. And the most well-established uh, group that is um, uh, universally recognized from this phylogeny are the tetrapulmonates, the group that is confirmed by those arachnids that bear uh, book lungs. But um, morphological hypotheses are not necessarily universally congruent or well supported. Uh, the other uh, second probably influence uh, work is that of Jeffrey Schulz from 1990. And uh, it builds upon the work of Peter Beigold, but uh, it makes an important distinction. And it is that it assumes the fact of the monophyly of arachnida. So it does not include in its discussion of characters or in any other analytical fashion, representatives of the Eurypterids or uh, of the sea spiders. Thus in this particular analysis, the monophyly of arachnida is de facto uh, uh, constrained, is not tested, uh, and all characters' uh, argumentations are based on this assumption. And there are some uh, important differences that, uh, that I'm not gonna uh, discuss in detail, 
But uh, probably some of the most important is that scorpions are no longer considered the sister group of, of, to the rest of the arachnids, uh, instead in a, in a right, derived position. But uh, it also recognized a monophyletic acari with the same relationship with the uh, ricinulates as, and the same aplocnemata clade of uh, solid fugitives and pseudoscorpions, as well as the well established uh, tetrapulmonates. Thus, in, in spite of some of these differences, these morphological classic studies of calicerates serve as the basis to establish some of the most enduring hypotheses in calicerate phylogeny. Uh, foremost, the monophyly of the terrestrial arachnids, as well as the monophylum of the acari lineages, the acari forms and the parasitic forms, and that these uh, lineages are closely related to the ricinule, uh, the sister shape relationship between the um, solid fusion scorpions and the well established uh, tetrapulmonate clade. Uh, so, embedded in this um, uh, early hypothesis is this prevailing paradigm that the evolution of calicerates is uh, driven by the transition from the aquatic uh, habitat considered to be represented by primitive lineage, uh, such as uh, the horseshoe crabs and the eurypterids, and that it is the transition uh, to the land that fosters the diversification of modern arachnids. Uh, fast forward to the present, and then we are embedded into this uh, controversy that uh, it is um, uh, dealing with the position or the placement, uh, particularly of the horseshoe crabs. So in 2019, we published this um, um, centered on testing whether this relationship was um, trustworthy or uh, the, the result of an artifact. Uh, I got to remember that um, to the audience that this grouping that is treated as uh, anomalous, it is indeed the most recurrent um, resolution for phylogenetic analysis of calicerates that are based on molecules. Uh, regardless whether we are talking of a handful of genes like 18S or, or mitochondrial genes, uh, as well as in the majority of the phylogenomic analysis uh, to date. And uh, we moved beyond the phylogeny uh, in this particular study and made a in-depth um, treatment of how was the signal being um, um, how was the signal distributed across the different data classes and whether these were uh, the result of incomplete linear sorting or any other um, known source of artifacts. And we found to no uh, ex other explanation other than to assume that this was indeed a accurate uh, placement. But uh, this was, um, uh, this hypothesis was soon followed by uh, another result by uh, Lozano Fernandez uh, and collaborators uh, in which they uh, proposed that uh, incidentally they could recover um, the monophyly, the traditional monophyly of uh, calicerate, uh, I'm sorry, of arachnida in some of it, uh, its matrices. Uh, importantly, in this uh, study, it made uh, some interesting predictions uh, Lozano Fernandez uh, and collaborators suggest that these results of finding nested uh, horseshoe crabs in the arachnid is the result of a, a series of um, uh, uh, effects that are caused by, uh, that can be fixed by increasing the taxon sampling or using a slow evolving uh, loci exclusively and in combination with the CAT GTR uh, plus gamma model. I'll talk about more in detail about those uh, things uh, later on the, the, during the talk, but uh, I just need to remind you that it is not one or the other of these different conditions that is required according to these authors to recover the monophyly of arachnida, but all of them in conjunction are needed to overcome this uh, artifact. So, the, there are reasons of why uh, it is very hard to solve this uh, phylogeny. The diversification of calistrates and arachnida, including, it's a very old and occurred over a short uh, period of time. It's an ancient rapid radiation. And on top of that, 
it is also written uh, with uh, known um, effects of uh, long branch attraction that have been very well documented. In particular, the miniaturized uh, lineages such as Cirroscorpions and the two Akari orders, both Akari forms and Parasiti forms, are uh, known to uh, possess elevated rates of molecular evolution and that endangers uh, long branch attraction. Some other uh, uh, lineages such as the palpigrades may also be subject to this particular artifact, but the sampling it's it's being meager to have to reach a um, um, conclusion. And on top of of those uh, challenges, it is the phylogenetic history the, uh, of uh, Calicerata has been also limited by uh, a sample failing to sample some of the most key taxa. In particular, in analysis of glycerates often miss uh, palpigrates or, uh, or the opilio acarates, which are members of the parasitic forms, um, but uh, a, in a more basal position and potentially, uh, potentially being of importance uh, in resolving and breaking those long branches, as well as other arachnids such as schizomids. And even though they've been, uh, these other lineages have been present in all the rest of the majority of the analysis, uh, they have been typically uh, more poorly sampled when compared to the other groups. Either in their, uh, in their taxon uh, sampling and also in the quality of the uh, genetic material that is being available. So what is what we need to achieve a well-sampled calicerate uh, phylogenetic tree. So some of those uh, gaps are being uh, uh, filled up. We recently published the first phylogenomic analysis of calicerates that included all representatives of all calicerate orders by sequencing a transcriptom of a palpigrate and analyzing it uh, in combination with the uh, previous um, phylogenomic data set we published in 2019. And at the same time, we are also benefiting from this accumulation of genomic data from other groups in particular, uh, and just to cite a few examples, we are indebted, for example, to the data sets of uh, uh, Ligia uh, and collaborators that uh, recently uh, published the of Cirroscorpions, greatly enriching one of those taxa that had been notoriously undersampled and bear an important uh, um, aspect for the glycerate evolution. And recently as well, we also look at the pycnogonids to have a increased phylogenomic resolution, in this case, based on UCE and hybrid enrichment um, uh, techniques. Thus, we are slowly building up the genomic resources towards getting a large scale phylogeny of this group. So uh, my goals uh, for this talk are uh, to infer a phylogeny on a large scale data set, uh, explore the effect of these uh, slow evolving uh, genes that are supposed to bear uh, the key to solving uh, or ob obtaining monophyletic arachnida, assert the uh, effect of size heterogeneous models, which also in conjunction with the slow evolving sites are supposed to be the magic of all it. And uh, more importantly, my one of my real interests is understand uh, the source of the conflicting uh, signal and and how do they affect the phylogenetic inference, well, not only of calicerates, but of other recalcitrant nodes in the tree of life. So to this effect, we put together a uh, data set that includes uh, 506 uh, different terminals. And this um, data set includes of our representatives of all extant calicerate uh, uh, orders. And more importantly, every single one of the orders is represented by more than one species. Thus, this effectively will be the first data set that is explicitly testing the monophyly of each of those uh, higher lineages in the calicerate tree of life. And in some cases, we have a very dense uh, sample that allows us to also explore how, um, um, how the models behave in terms of resolving will would would be positive control cases. Those, those are recovering relationships that we already are, um, um, are well understood for us, as well as testing those that are uh, still 
uh, less uh, sampled. Those uh, improvement in the sampling of these um, terminals can, can of course uh, take place uh, in all cases, except probably in the case of the horseshoe crabs, where we already can um, have the complete sampling of a group that has four species, so they are already included uh, here. In terms of gene samplings, um, it is um, a different uh, opposite strategy, basically. In the 2019 uh, paper, uh, the largest data set that we analyzed was more than 10,000 genes. And, uh, uh, and we now know that we need to move in a different direction by sampling uh, more taxa. So uh, this followed a completely different strategy. And one of the, mo the most difficult parts of analyzing this type of data set is assessing which genes to include and how to identify them. So because orthology assessment in a data set of this scale is simply unfeasible, no matter what method uh, it's, it's thrown on it, we resorted to use the same orthologs that were previously identified um, in the Mrs. Bio study in 2019. This consists of two trials um, of 3,500 different orthologous genes. And from these genes, what I did was build a hidden Markov model, which is a mathematical representation in a given locus, and use that mathematical representation that is now being atomized into a single uh, computational unit to search the large uh, database of different transcriptomes that we are now uh, going to be looking for homologous to these uh, genes. And I built uh, a um, ad hoc um, program to do this classification that is uh, keeping the records of all the possible match, but selected only the best. And these are then later uh, validated uh, using a different filtering um, a criterion. In this case, the criterion was that all members of the same ortho group should have the same annotation to the Drosophila melanogaster genome. That was an arbitrary decision, and that doesn't mean that Drosophila is necessarily present uh, in that gene, but it at least um, um, guarantees that all of these different loci that were pulled together from, from uh, various uh, sources are indeed showing this uh, a commonality in the identity of their gene. And finally, another important uh, criterion to building up these data sets was to maximize uh, decisiveness. And what I mean by this, decisiveness is a property of a phylogenetic data set in which the taxon composition is such that it guarantees that the question that you are uh, interested on is going to be tested in a way explicitly. So in, in lay uh, terms, what it means is that we guarantee that at least one representative of each of the orders and an outgroup is present in the data set. And why we resort to this um, um, criterion. Uh, and the main cause is because there are other measures of completeness that can uh, mislead or give us a false impression of having uh, a thorough data set. Um, for example, one of the most common um, parameters is using um, uh, gene occupancy in terms of uh, thresholds of percentage of, of taxon per gene. But in a 506 uh, uh, data set, we can have a gene and enforce a 95% tax uh, completion. And yet in this type of uh, scale, we, we will be risking not having representations of the, of the taxa that we are probably more interested on. For example, palpitate or horseshoe crabs. By enforcing decisiveness, we ensure that every single gene uh, is testing the relationships of all the Kelly's rates. Thus, I'm not going to uh, go into too much details about the rest of the phylogenomic methods that I follow. I'm happy to discuss them at length uh, um, later. Um, but briefly, um, we use analysis using a decided regime use model uh, called PMSF. 
Um, we also analyze the data partitioned and as well, we apply summary quiescent models uh, in, in Astral. And for the first uh, data set that we constructed, the primary data set, we identified 676 genes and this represents uh, these many sites and only 28% uh, of those entries of those sites of the matrix represent missing data or gaps. And this is how the tree uh, looks like. And I don't expect you to get any detail from this, except from the fact that uh, it gives you an idea of the distribution of branch lengths. So to get a, a overview that there are nothing obviously anomalous loose and also of the distribution of uh, bootstrap support. So this purplish uh, color represent those edges that have a maximal bootstrap support and has the color get warmer, the support uh, diminishes. So you can see that um, there is overall good support across many of the branches of the trees, particularly on those other leaves. And some of the relationships of the glycerates um, are, are still uh, displaying uh, uh, relatively lower values of support. Uh, other areas of the tree so more, so, uh, show all uh, different degrees of conflicts, for example, uh, here, and, and we'll, we'll take a closer look uh, in a minute. So if we want to look, for example, at those uh, particular clades, uh, just to verify that uh, things make sense, we are able to recover internal relationships of the spiders has, has they have already been established by a previous phylogenomic uh, analysis, uh, for example, those of Kalal and collaborators. Uh, same occurs in the case of the scorpions, where this region of the tree mirrors the results of Carlos and Tibanez uh, et al. And uh, the same occurs for Opilionis. So we identified the major lineages and we don't see effects of major anomalies that will be, for example, because by sampling only uh, a small amount of deeper uh, shared uh, um, genes. And it is impossible to see the tree as it is in a real form. So here is the collapsed version of that. I have uh, uh, indicated here the nodes uh, that have support less than the complete support. So some of those are in, in moderate uh, values, uh, for example, here at the base of the tree. But, uh, but irrespectively, we observe, again, uh, the nested placement of uh, horseshoe crabs, again, sister to the um, recent ole, and also acariforms and parasitiforms are each in a different region of the tree. They don't form a clade. Um, so the next step for us was to identify or generate a data set that included a slow evolving genes. And the search for a slow evolving genes has a solution for ancient radiations. It's, it has a long story. Um, but um, there is a still a lot of discussion on what is a good measure for assessing the rate of evolution of a given gene, particularly in the absence of a tree, those a priori. The solution pro um, um, proposed by Lozano and collaborators was using this um, plot of saturation. Um, and basically what this plot represents is in the x-axis, having the um, in the x axis having the distances induced by the maximum likelihood uh, tree and in the y axis the humming distances between the two sequences thus in the x axis is the genetic the evolutionary distance as it's inferred by the model and in the y axis is the the simple differences that we observe in the sequences each one of these dots represent a, a pairwise comparison between uh, two terminals. For example, it could be that one of these points represent the, dif the, the relationship of these distances between um, one of the out groups, a, um, a the Drosophila melanogaster, for example, and the horseshoe crab. Uh, and so all sorry, possible- Sorry, Jesus, uh, yes. you have 25 minutes. That's 25 minutes. I mean, I mean the 25 minutes mark. Yes. Oof. All right, I'm gonna rush. Good. So, 
uh, saturation, uh, I'm sorry, genes were identified using this criterion for saturation uh, again, and uh, we um, uh, run, uh, detect, selected 158 slow evolving genes. Once again, horseshoe crabs were found nested inside uh, arachnida. We tried a differing um, um, orthology uh, criterion uh, using Busco genes. And the result is again mirrored again. Horseshoe crabs are found inside and Akari and parasitiforms are each in a different region of the tree. And for an overview of the summary relationships across all the different analyses, including uh, the coalescent methods, we observed that of the traditional relationships, the only one that is supported by the phylogenomic analysis is that of the tetrapulmonates. Uh, consistently, horseshoe crabs are found and nested inside Ricinule, and new hypotheses emerge uh, regarding the relationships of the different um, uh, uh, acariforms and parasitiform uh, lineages. We also tried the um, um, KGTR model, and let me just run over this because this is not important. This is the tails of analysis that I can discuss later. But suffice to say that once again, using these um, um, using these methods, uh, we found the derived position of horseshoe crabs. The support there uh, drops a bit. Nonetheless, this uh, the relationship of horseshoe crabs is again uh, uh, established in this. Um, a phylobase uh, analysis. And finally, due to the lack of time, I'm not gonna explain um, these uh, parts here, which tend to be uh, overcomplicated, uh, on, but let me just jump to the very last uh, result. And that is that um, we did not find any relationship between the um, the signal, the differential signal of a given gene and the uh, metrics for uh, saturation or rate of evolution. That is, that, it, that is the conjecture of a slow evolving genes being behind a horseshoe crabs at a derived arachnid are not sub substantiated. Uh, instead, what we have found is that there is a relationship um, between the amount of noise has measured by uh, site entropy with the, uh, with the recovery of anomalous um, groupings, including uh, that of the um, horseshoe crabs with, um, uh, of, of traditional arachnida. Those we, um, so one of the results of this analysis is that the resolution of horseshoe crabs has a, bi a basal chelicerate is the result of noise in the data and not the actual signal. And I guess that I'll just wait for questions. Um. Thank you, Jesus. Muchas gracias por, no, por la, que lo... la fantástica y por el, un, un tópico fascinante y complicadísimo. Eh, tenemos tiempo para una pregunta rápida antes de la sesión de los pósteres, pero igual tendremos más tiempo más tarde en el happy hour. A ver, Darko, te voy a pasar la palabra para que sea rapidísimo. Jesús, are there transitional fossils that suggest the return to the water of horseshoe crabs? So that is a very interesting question. So um, not of horseshoe crabs, uh, not to my knowledge, right? Um, but I think that all of those conjectures are based on certain assumptions about how unlikely it is those ecological transitions in chelicerates in particular. And this is nonetheless surprising because we have seen similar transitions in other regions of the tree of life. So like the closest example is that of the mandibulates, uh, myriapods and, um, and uh, um, insects independently colonize the land. And uh, for the horseshoe crabs, we have evidence that some fossils were um, freshwater um, um, organisms instead of uh, marine as those are nowadays. 
And in other regions of the calyceres, we also see those ecological transitions. Uh, for example, the aquatic uh, hydrocarines and halocarid mites, those are secondary transitions to the aquatic habitat that, that have occurred and they are not anomalies. So I think that the take home message is that these assumptions based on the unlikeliness of these ecological uh, transitions how are just not substantiated. <laughs>